Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I was staring at my computer screen when she walked into the den. She had been coming home from work late for a long time. Today was no different. It was almost 10 o'clock. The kids and I had already had dinner and finished homework. They had been in bed for almost an hour. They hadn't even asked about their mother or why she wasn't home. That was a recent development and it saddened me. I had spent the last hour reviewing our finances. During the last two years, things had gotten dramatically worse. Our income was way down, not that my wife had noticed. She was still spending freely, as if we didn't have a care in the world. I had just finished paying the latest round of bills. We could maybe make it another couple of months. I had been reviewing my life plan, too. Maybe I had made a mistake. I had spent the last two years staring at a ticking time bomb, wondering if it was ever going to detonate. I always figured it would at some point, but I was starting to have my doubts. I don't know how long she stood there staring at me. I was getting lost in my own thoughts more and more often lately. Losing track of time was the byproduct. Finally, with her arms crossed and the all-too-familiar look of disdain on her face, she spoke. Michael, I want a divorce. I'm not sure what my feelings were at that particular moment. My spirit was so overburdened with self-doubt and loathing, I was almost numb to any new emotions. It really wasn't really all that funny, but I still found myself trying to stifle a laugh. My wife of 17 years had just told me we were over, that all we had built together would finally be torn apart. I hadn't felt this particular emotion in a long time, and it almost made me smile. Relief. I looked at her for just a moment, allowing myself a final journey to our happier times. Then it was back to reality. Okay. I was a better programmer than a manager. Unfortunately, programmers get promoted to project leaders, then to department chiefs, and then to senior management. That is how I ended up as the senior manager of product development. It was just a fancy title for a salesman. The reality was, at the time, I was the most qualified for the position. I had birthed our flagship product line almost by myself. I had nursed it through infancy, helped it grow during six successive upgrades. I knew our product best. When customers had questions, I had answers. When our staff had problems, I knew how to fix them. Add a new hairstyle and overpriced suit, and I sure looked the part. The increased salary and benefits that came with my promotions were nothing to sneeze at. I would say I was mostly content with my job, but I loved programming and missed it a great deal. In my position, I never had the chance to do it. There were just too many meetings and phone calls to allow myself the luxury of jumping back into lines of code. I was forced to watch a new batch of young, wild-eyed kids trying to one-up each other with their latest developments. I won't lie. Being the boss was worth it but I always wished that my job duties were a bit different. It was no surprise when I was fired from Chicago Technology Solutions. If I was in charge of me, I would have done the same thing. My attendance at meetings was sporadic at best, and too many deadlines had been missed. At the time, I wasn't trying to get fired, but I really didn't make any attempt to keep my job at CTS. I had been in a funk for a long time. It took me almost three months to get over my original depressed state and try and move forward but that had been a miserable failure, too. It took me another month to find a solution to the predicament I found myself in, at least one that I could live with. I think I would have lost my mind had if I didn't have the kids. They had an unblemished routine that helped me get my life back on a positive track. Breakfast, school, snack, homework, dinner, bed. Breakfast, school, snack, homework, dinner, bed. That was my mantra and it helped me find my way. I dove headfirst into being a stay-at-home dad. I took over all the housekeeping and taxi duties. The kids genuinely enjoyed my increased presence in the house. That allowed me to realize I had some value. I wasn't completely worthless. If my wife sensed this change in our family dynamic, she never mentioned it. I am almost positive that she didn't even notice. I met Jennifer Riley at a fraternity mixer. I had almost decided not to go. I had joined the fraternity for the doors it would open after graduation not to attend parties while in school. I figured I was going to need all the help I could get. My grades were outstanding, so that wasn't a worry. However, everything else about me was just average. Height, weight, looks, personality. Average. My name, Michael, was the most popular name from 1961 to 1988. Completely average. To be honest, when I was away from a computer, there really wasn't anything all that unique about me. Dates? I had a few. Relationships? Well, not so much. I was getting pretty good at keeping myself company even during my senior year of college. Until I saw Jennifer Riley. Jennifer was almost as average as me. 
I realized that average on a woman looked a whole lot better. She was a bit of a wallflower. I watched her for quite some time before I could gather up enough courage to speak to her. Our initial meeting was brief and quiet, but introductions were made. In the next few weeks, we met for coffee and shared study time at the library. We had been talking for almost two months before our first real date. From that date on, it was the most fantastic time of my life. Fifteen years of bliss. Our courtship was short. Our engagement was even shorter. We were married and at home in our first apartment in Chicago soon after graduation. We shared a morning and evening train to and from our first jobs. We were barely making it financially, but we were in it together. We had nearly everything in common. Family histories, dating experiences, shared interests and goals. Where we didn't match, we meshed. If there was something that I didn't do well, Jennifer did. If she had a shortcoming, it was one of my strengths. I was better at managing our shared finances. Jennifer was better at keeping our social and family schedules. We worked together, and our lives quickly started to improve. We were both promoted several times over the next few years. Our friend group expanded a great deal. We were able to save money for our first home purchase and still travel and entertain ourselves. Our sex life had started off much like our relationship, slowly. We held hands and kissed from our first date on. We moved on to heavy petting when we realized that we were exclusive. Our virginities lasted until the night of our engagement. From there, our passion grew with our shared success. Jennifer quit her job after eight years when our son, Jacob, was born. Our daughter, Emily, followed a little over a year later. Yes, I know their names were, in fact, the most popular names when they were born. It was sort of a family tradition. We bought a three-bedroom house in the suburbs with room for a dog. We purchased a family sedan and a minivan. In general, our lives had shaped up nicely. Two kids, a pet, a house, and two cars. Completely average. I didn't think it was possible for me to be any happier. I was wrong. My promotion to manager happened shortly after Emily's first birthday. After that, it was almost like I was being rewarded for years of being ignored as one of the average masses and not complaining. Like I said, my new salary was nothing to sneeze at and we didn't. I had flexible scheduling, working from home most days, heading to the office for staff and management team meetings. They say that money can't buy you happiness. I believe that is true. What it can buy you is stylish clothes and personal grooming, better health care, a newer home and a better neighborhood and confidence. I went from average to slightly above average. My wife went from average, which I thought was beautiful, to slightly above average, which I thought was hot. Our sex life, which I always felt was good, hit a new high. We traveled better and were able to spend time with the children all while saving more and more money for retirement. When Emily started elementary school, Jennifer decided she wanted to go back to work part-time. She quickly found a job that she thought she would like at a startup marketing firm. She would head to her office when she took the kids to school. She ended her day when it was time to pick them up. It was the icing on the cake. We didn't need her salary, so we were able to save it. By my projections, by the time the kids were finishing college, we would be able to retire and live a very comfortable life. I found out my wife was cheating on me by accident three months before our 15th wedding anniversary. It was my birthday. I actually found the evidence two days before my birthday. I just didn't know it. It took me a few weeks to piece it all together. I didn't make much of the fact that my wife wanted to take a more active role in her new job. It meant that she would work a few more hours a week and I would have to pick up the kids from school. But that didn't really affect my schedule at all and I was glad to do it. When, after about three months, I noticed that she was often distracted, I asked her about it. She said she was trying to find her stride at the office and was a little stressed. I decided to take over some more responsibilities at home to relieve some of her burden. When our passionate sex life took a noticeable dip, we talked about it. She said she was getting older and didn't need to screw like a rabbit. It was the first time I had ever heard her say such things, but things improved. Our sex life did pick up for a few weeks, then dropped off again. I was hesitant to mention anything again for fear of an argument. I was almost at my wit's end when I found the present. The weather had cooled considerably and I was looking for one of my sweaters. I had taken on laundry duty and had more than once mixed up which closet the clothes should go in. I was shuffling through sweaters on her closet shelf when I saw it behind several old shoe boxes. It was hard to miss. The pink box and white ribbon from the lingerie store was unmistakable. The card address to lover got me excited. A small war of thoughts broke out in my head for a moment. Should I look? Should I wait? I decided to look. I wasn't sure I was going to be able to wait until my birthday to ravage my wife after reading the card. 
Please excuse the packaging that this gift came in. You can unwrap your real present on your birthday when I am wearing what is inside the box. Love always, Jennifer. For the next 48 hours, I stepped up my game. I made sure to greet her at the door with flowers, gave her a foot massage, and I made her favorite dinner. Her reaction was not what I expected. It was like she was tolerating my affection. The day of my birthday, I made sure that the kids finished their homework early. I didn't want any problems interrupting my gift. I was a little surprised when Jennifer was home late from work. I was even more confused when she asked me what was for dinner. But I was willing to play along to get my surprise. I said we should go out for pizza. The kids cheered and we were off. Michael conspired with our waitress and just before we left I was serenaded with happy birthday by the wait staff. I thought I saw surprise in my wife's eyes, but she quickly recovered. I'll give you your present later, Michael, she said as she smiled. The drive home was tense for me. I almost got in an accident. The 15 minutes waiting for the kids to get ready for bed was brutal, but the 15 minutes after that, waiting for them to fall asleep, was excruciating. Fortunately, Jennifer was back from an emergency trip to the store for milk shortly after they were asleep. When I arrived at the bedroom door, Jennifer wasn't in the room. I went to sit on the bed. A few moments later, she walked out of the bathroom in a full-length flannel nightgown, face devoid of makeup, with her hair in a ponytail. I was getting a little frustrated with the games at this point. When was I going to get my present? She slid into bed and under the covers. She reached to turn off her bedroom lamp, then stopped. Oops, I almost forgot. She opened a drawer on her nightstand and pulled out a small square box, wrapped in the multicolor balloon paper we had used for Michael's last birthday, and handed it to me. Happy birthday, dear. And that was it. She rolled over, shut off her light, and went asleep. I was too shocked to even open her gift. My depression started in full force the next day. I replayed the day's events over and over in my mind and could not figure what I had done that had so clearly put a damper on our evening. I was at a total loss. I stewed in my own despair for almost two weeks. That damn present was almost blinking pink at me announcing my failure. I have heard all the cliches. The husband is the last to know, etc. I have to be honest and say that I was legitimately clueless. The thought of Jennifer cheating on me was so foreign that I never, not once, considered it was possible. But it was the first thing that popped into my head when she called home 13 days after my birthday announcing she would be late getting home. It's Alan's 30th birthday and the staff is taking him out to celebrate. I might be pretty late. I don't remember responding to her or walking to the bedroom closet, but I do remember looking at the empty space where my present once sat. I also remember the horrible pain in my chest and throwing up in the bathroom. For longer than I care to admit, I thought I might be having a heart attack, and for a few moments I hoped that it was true and that I would soon be dead. Alan Henderson was Jennifer's boss, a slick sleazy-looking advertising executive who was a few years younger than both Jennifer and me. I had only met the man once, and I remembered not liking him very much, mostly because he seemed so disingenuous any time he was speaking. It was Emily that brought me back to my senses. Are you okay, Daddy? It took a few seconds before my eyes focused on my daughter who was hovering over me on the verge of tears. I am fine, sweetheart. Daddy just ate something that didn't agree with his stomach. I'll be out in just one minute. I just need to clean myself up. I did eventually get myself out of the bathroom, though I don't remember much after that. I do remember grabbing my dusty bottle of scotch. Based on the headache I had the next morning, I knew that I had thrown down several glasses. I had no idea when Jennifer had returned home. When I found her in the kitchen feeding the children the net morning, she didn't look like anything out of the ordinary had happened. She was just going through her routine. It was the slight wince I saw in her face when she sat down to eat that killed any love that I had left. It was very subtle, but it was there. I wish that I could write about how I confronted my cheating wife, but I didn't. I was just devastated. It was all I could do to move, and it didn't get any better for several weeks. I was a zombie, as I recognized each day that my wife was going through the motions at home without a care in the world. I felt worse and worse. I thought I had hit rock bottom. It took me until the weekend of my 15th wedding anniversary to shake myself and decide to take action. I probably wouldn't have done anything. I was being a simp. I knew it. I would like to say that I was in shock. There are probably some technical psychological terminology for my behavior. If my dad were alive, he would have just said I was being a simp. He would have been right. It wasn't until my wife announced that she had to travel for work conference that the fog lifted from my thoughts. She would be gone during our anniversary. I am not sure why this mattered to me. It was just one more level of disrespect. But it hurt. 
mostly because she gave no indication that she was even aware of the date. After drinking myself to sleep on the night of our anniversary, I woke up angry. I had hit my limit. I called my lawyer and made an appointment. I was going to end this charade. I was certain my life couldn't get any worse. I was wrong. The take no prisoners attitude I entered my attorney's office with was replaced with a crushing disbelief. I knew divorces could be difficult. I thought that my wife cheating on me would work in my favor. Instead, my lawyer punched hole after hole in my case. I had no evidence of an affair. If I had evidence, it wouldn't really matter. My wife would be entitled to a 50 50 split of our assets. I had no evidence of my wife being an unfit parent. My best hope would be shared custody. Our income disparity also worked in my wife's favor. I would pay spousal maintenance and child support. My wife would likely be granted primary custody and be entitled to remain in the house for the good of the children. My wife was a cheating 304 and I was the screwed buffoon. I went from depressed to distraught. My 304 even asked me about it after a few weeks. You really don't look good, Michael. Is something bothering you? No, dear. At least she pretended to care. Me, I just wandered through life. Then I got fired. I didn't know it at the time, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It was the evening news that gave me a glimmer of hope. I was watching depressing story after depressing story. It seemed to coincide quite nicely with my mood. But then there it was. A major East Coast employer had gone bankrupt. Former employees were scrambling to get final paychecks and were worried about their pensions. I actually felt like some people might be in a worse position than I was. Then the talking head came back on screen with his analysis. The employees would likely win a judgment against their former employer, but it wouldn't matter. There was nothing left. All of the money was gone. It didn't take much for me to connect the dots and form the basics of a plan. My wife couldn't take what wasn't there. We would have nothing, so we would split nothing. Sure. I would be screwing myself at the same time, but I was already going to lose half anyway. Did I really care about the rest? My plan started out simple enough. I was unemployed and I wasn't going to look for work. I was going to spend our life savings until there was nothing left. I admit it was a harebrained idea. Even I didn't think it would work. But it was something I could cling to. Two years is a long time. It was painfully boring for me when I was alone, which was most of the time. I realized that Jennifer really had been the lifeblood of our friend group. As she distanced herself from me, I found myself without any truly strong friendships. I was an only child. Both of my parents had died young, dad from a heart attack, mom from cancer. I was truly alone. I can sum up my life easily by saying it was dreadful. For two years my children were the only thing right in my life. I had never before spent money on anything extraneous. I was still keeping receipts for everything I purchased. I started making small weekly cash withdrawals and setting the money aside. It occurred to me after about two months that we weren't spending money fast enough to make any difference. Apparently, I was really good at saving money and not so good at spending it. So, I upped my game and made some adjustments to my initial plan. I enrolled in an executive MBA program. The university was pricey but local. In one shot, I spent almost $120,000. I paid cash for a new luxury SUV, $60,000 out the window. I fully funded educational savings accounts for the kids. That took another $260,000. I spent thousands on a new wardrobe, and I started taking larger and larger cash withdrawals twice a week. I would drive the kids to school, hit the bank, and head to the lakeshore. I never really gambled the money I took with me. A few bucks here and there, so that I was at least entertaining myself. I spent enough to show that I had spent the day in the casino, including receipts for lunch and snacks and parking. The bulk was going to the wall safe in our garage. My personal post-divorce war chest in case things got ugly. My other expensive purchase? Full-time private surveillance on my wife and her lover. I asked for the works, video, pictures, a daily diary of events. I am embarrassed to say how much that cost me. You may be wondering if my wife noticed any of my spending habits. I would say yes, except for the gambling. I had to tell her about my transfer of money to the kids because I needed her signature on the custodial accounts. She saw my car and clothes. She never said anything about them. I am sure she thought I was working and that we were still living on Easy Street. She made a few purchases too and I never said a word. I often did wonder who was getting the benefit of her more frequent lingerie purchases. It just never was a topic we discussed. We were cordial to each other and interacted daily. It was like we were each tolerating a roommate that we didn't particularly like. Sex? Don't even go there. The time with my children was the highlight of my existence. 
I did my best to support any of their interests. We worked through homework together and played games. We went to parks, took bike rides, and went to movies. Since I had assumed the role of house chef, they seemed to be interested in helping me. I found some easy recipes and let them do just that. Jennifer was usually around at some point in the week. I didn't exclude her from our family time, but I made no effort to include her. If she was around and wanted to participate, she just did without a word from me one way or the other. I got a weekly report of my wife's activities. I thought that she was just banging her boss, but it was really a few guys from her office. A few months later, the company's clients made their way to her dance card. Did it hurt? Not really. I already thought she was a 304. That I now had proof really didn't move me at all. It was not a very interesting read. The videos were like really poorly directed prawn. In some ways it did make me feel better, but not much. It was clear that Alan Henderson wasn't a very skilled lover, though he had the opportunity to spread his gifts amongst several different women. That kind of surprised me. I had assumed, based on her gift, that he and my 304 were in some kind of relationship, but in reality, they were more like screw buddies. He simply rutted my wife with his slightly below average tools and she let him. It was the same with most of the other six men who screwed my wife. There was one client though, a small nerdy looking guy sporting the glasses and pocket protector to solidify his status as a geek that really let Jennifer have it. The pictures and video were too grainy to tell if she enjoyed it, but to me it looked rather painful. I stopped the surveillance after a year. I had seen enough and it was really more of a chore to review the garbage that was sent my way. Despite my classes, kids and gambling, I had a lot of free time. So, I decided to concentrate on my life after marriage which I assumed would be coming at some point. I started a new exercise regime. I had always been in decent shape, nothing to write home about of course. Over the time, I did make some decent gains on my bench press and running stamina. I think that huge muscles and good looks are mostly genetic, and I clearly did not fit into either category. However, personally, I was really pleased with the way I looked. I started researching the latest news on my former industry. I figured I would need a job at some point. A year away from the madness had left me farther behind than I thought. I spent a few hours each day learning about the latest technologies and software packages. I took a particular interest in my old company CTS. It appeared they were stagnant. They were definitely not losing market share and revenues were stable, but they weren't gaining ground. In the technology business, if you were standing still, you were losing. I also spent a considerable amount of time researching divorces. Oh, I did indulge some time to devising new and evil plans for screwing with my hopefully soon-to-be ex-wife. However, the majority of my time was spent learning how divorce affected children. I had already worked through most of my pain and the children had been a big part of that. I wanted to make sure that when their transition came that I was fully prepared. There is a lot of information out there a lot of which I thought was bullshit. I was another eight months into my adventure when I started to panic. My wife started coming home at a regular time and she started talking to me and asking about my day. I answered curtly, of course, but she seemed undeterred. She started dressing more provocatively for bed. It seemed like she was trying to rekindle the intimacy of our former life. After a few weeks, it went from bad to worse. For a year and a half, she had been uninvolved and going through the motions. Now she was bitching about our lack of communication. She started talking about working on our marriage. So, I stopped talking to her. Complete silence. Her reconciliation attempts lasted until her birthday. I left her present on the dining room table. The wrapping paper should have looked familiar since I recycled it from the last gift she had given me. The contents shouldn't have been a surprise either. It took me six months to open the last birthday present I would get from my wife. It was a watch, complete with a cheap digital face. When I noticed my birthday present in the impulse buy aisle of our neighborhood 24-hour convenience store, I had been pretty angry. A $9.95 watch from the Quickie Mart. Effing bitch. When I saw they had a matching ladies model, I got over it. I bought it and waited 18 months to give it to her. I almost wish I could have seen her reaction, but alas I wasn't there when she opened it. The kids and I had an emergency movie night and were pretty late getting home. She was gone before the kids and I were up the next day. Suddenly everything went back to my new normal. Jennifer started staying later and later at the office. We barely spoke when she was at home. Then it finally came. Michael, I want a divorce. I was hoping that she would get it over with quickly, but it was almost a week later before I was served with her petition. It was almost laughable. Spousal and child support, unequal distribution of assets in her favor, 
mental and emotional cruelty listed as the relevant factors. I waited until the next Monday before taking the kids camping. I didn't want them to be around when I unleashed the hounds. We returned six days later, relaxed and refreshed. Jennifer was waiting for us at home. She was sitting alone in the living room. I think she may have had the stomach flu. In any case, she didn't look good. I was wondering which part came as the biggest surprise. I had counterfiled for divorce based on adultery. Asking for the house, the only real asset we had left, and full custody of the children. I asked for spousal and child support because I was unemployed and had been taking care of the children full-time for two years. I had filed alienation of affection lawsuits against Jennifer's seven sexual partners. I had no illusion that I would win any of them, but Illinois law allowed it, so I was coming back guns blazing. I filed civil lawsuits against her employer and the companies of the three clients who had enjoyed my wife's 304 status. Again, I didn't think that I could win, but the bad publicity might work in my favor. Finally, I sent a DVD of Jennifer's greatest hits to her parents and her best friend so she would know I wouldn't be afraid to use it. She should have been aware of the evidence I had against her. It had all been named in my counter suit, but I didn't want to take any chances. The kids grabbed a snack and went to their rooms to get ready for bed. They didn't really acknowledge their mother. She made no move to address them. I went to the fridge to grab a beer. Then I made my way to living room and plopped down on the chair opposite Jennifer. She didn't look at me for a long time. So, I just enjoyed my beer. In addition to being sick, she appeared to be crying about something. Maybe she was injured? Eventually she spoke, but it was almost a whisper. You'll ruin me. I waited for her to look up so that I could watch her eyes when I responded. It took a few seconds. God. I hope so. I thought the moment would be more fulfilling. When the single tear formed in her eye and then fell down her cheek, I didn't feel anything. Do you hate me that much? Oh, no Jennifer. I don't hate you. Hate requires effort and feelings. I have none for you, and I can honestly say that I put forth absolutely no effort when it comes to you. All of my effort goes to taking care of me and my children. But I am your whiff. Stop. I will not have a piece of shit like you defame my wife's good name. My wife was a loving and caring woman, my best friend and partner, and the mother of my children. She is dead. You are the 304 that took over her body. Don't speak as if you have any relationship to me. It was a long time before she spoke again. What am I going to do now? Is that a rhetorical question, or do you really want my answer? I didn't let her respond before I continued. I suppose there are several possible solutions to your predicament. You could move far away and try and start a new life. That's the one I would choose. I am never going to let my children spend any meaningful time with you, so that shouldn't have any impact on your decision to leave. Or I suppose you could try and stick it out here. Hang around town trying to keep your head up. But who knows who will hear about your little exploits or who would want to hire a effing 304 like you. You may be able to latch onto some loser of a man who doesn't care that you're a 304, but what kind of a low-life scumbag would that be? Or you could kill yourself. I really hope you don't pick that option. That would rob me of watching you suffer. But then again, I'm not sure my opinion really matters to a 304 like you. It sure didn't when you decided to start screwing your boss. I have been dreaming of giving that little speech for months. I should have been happy about the opportunity to give it. As I watched word after word crush whatever was left of her spirit, I had hoped I would get some satisfaction. Instead, I just felt empty. Life after divorce was a mixed bag. I did much better with my lawsuits than I had ever hoped. I netted just over a million dollars in settlements from the three companies who had employees that had slept with my wife. It was surprising because my attorney told me not to expect much. During the post-game analysis, we decided that after seeing how he handled my ex-wife's company, they didn't want any part of the negative publicity. We had destroyed my ex-wife's company with discovery motions, depositions, and leaked information to the press. I had also started my own stealth campaign emailing the CEOs of their remaining clients with information about my wife, her boss, and their sex buddies. Do you really want to be in bed with this company when the shit hits the fan? It took time, but ever so slowly, their revenues dried up. Employees who didn't want to be associated with the scandal quit. In the end, they filed for bankruptcy. Alan Henderson was fired and left town in disgrace. The $200,000 check I received was smaller than my other victories, but much more satisfying. I didn't get anything from my alienation of affection lawsuits. I never thought I would. For wives did take their husbands to the cleaners and subsequent divorces though. It wasn't all champagne and roses. I also hurt myself in the process. It was not uncommon for me to run into someone familiar with my situation. 
The taunting and teasing were out of control for a while. I don't know if it was fortunate or unfortunate that I didn't really care. I already felt like a loser, so someone putting it into words didn't really affect me. Some of the bastards were actually pretty clever. I was able to shield my children from most of the collateral damage. That had always been my primary concern. They were sad for a while, but bounced back soon enough. My biggest victory was my return to CTS as Vice President of Design and Development. One of my distractions from my personal turmoil was a return to programming. In my two darkened years, I was able to design and add on to the primary CTS software that made it easy to integrate with two other popular software packages from their competitors. I started my own company and started selling my design. Less than a year later, I had offers from all three companies to buy my company and my software. I received $11 million for my company and an unbelievable compensation package from CTS. For a while, I considered retirement, but with my complete lack of social life, I was sure I was heading for life as a recluse if I didn't give myself an excuse to leave the house every day. My new income allowed me to hire a sweet little old lady who served as both part-time housekeeper and nanny for the kids. After a year, Mrs. Marlene Jensen moved in with us full-time, staying in the in-law suite above the garage of our new home. She was like a grandmother to my children, mostly sweet and kind but stern when she had to be. It was the advice she was able to offer the children, the kind that only comes from the wisdom of experience, which I appreciated most. I loved my children, and I did my best to be a supportive and caring father. But I was also damaged and jaded and hard. I, too, turned to her for advice. She was my sounding board when it was decision time. The children grew into well-adjusted adults, and I saw them in their families from time to time. Unfortunately, as time went on our closeness faded. I did not hold it against them in any way. It was best that I be kept at a distance so my bitterness wouldn't infect their lives. Mrs. Jensen worked for me until the kids left for college. Then she retired. I offered her free room and board as a pension. She had been a constant in my life for 15 years. She tried her best to get me to live again and find someone to share my life with. I appreciated her efforts, but, in the end, she died knowing that I would always be alone. I never really opened up to anyone ever again. My friendships were shallow and unfulfilling. I never really dated with the exception of a few group meals set up by casual friends. I developed a deserved reputation as an ice-hearted, ruthless bastard, who was not to be crossed. For the most part one was avoided, and I didn't blame anyone but me. If you were wondering what happened to Jennifer, well, she had a hard life. She tried for almost a year to talk to me. I am not sure why she tried. Did she think we could reconcile, or was she hoping for a relationship with my children? Maybe. I had given her fair warning, but she didn't listen. She tried to stay in Chicago, so I started having her followed. When she applied for a position, I made sure her work history was always there to greet her. When she started dating, which appeared to be almost immediately, I sent care packages to her potential mates letting them know all about the woman they were letting into their lives. I didn't really care if they wanted to keep her around after they knew the truth, but I didn't want her to be able to reshape history by ignoring it. I had to live with it every day, so it was only fair that she did too. As I said, my ex-wife kept up a steady campaign of unanswered phone calls, letters which I never read or responded to, and always kept my email inbox full. I think some sick part of me wanted some measure of her suffering. I suppose early on some type of professional help would have been appropriate. It may have saved some part of my soul and allowed me to gain back some sense of normalcy. But in the end, I never went, and as time passed it seemed too late to do any good. I could have changed my phone number, but I didn't. An assistant could have sorted my mail, but I always did it myself. I could have blocked her incoming emails. It would have prevented me from opening one of them accidentally. It was a stream of so sorry, and it didn't mean anything. Of course, it was a situation that got out of control. She had always loved me. Hadn't she suffered enough? I responded with a gift and a simple note. I purchased the smuttiest piece of lingerie I could find from her favorite store and had it wrapped carefully in the pure white ribbon that really brought out the pink of the box. I attached a beautifully handwritten note. I am sure she appreciated the symmetry as she opened the card address to 304. I hope she was able to understand my meaning when she found the massive but plug and bottle of lube in amongst her new 304 uniform. I thought the go F yourself was a pretty clear instruction. One of her potential partners tried to take me to task for tormenting my ex-wife. He showed up on my doorstep full of liquid courage, shoving me back and off my feet as I opened my front door. It was his mistake. As I have said, I am nothing special. I had no history of martial arts or special forces training. I was just an average guy. 
I had never been a violent man. Hell, I had never even been in a fight. But what I did have was rage, an undiluted, unspent pool of pure hatred for my wife and her lovers. He was the unfortunate recipient of my release. I ended up with a nice shiner and a cracked rib. He was lucky to be alive. He pled guilty to misdemeanor assault and unlawful entry and received probation as a first-time offender. I think the years of reconstructive surgery and rehabilitation left more of an impression on him. Jennifer never tried to contact me again. I stopped having her followed after another year when she found steady employment cleaning rooms at a highway hotel in a town about 700 miles from me in the backwoods of Virginia. The only other time I saw her was 16 years later at my daughter's wedding. I know the children reconnected with Jennifer several years after they graduated from college. I made no attempts to prevent them from finding her. The years had not been kind to her. She had gained at least 20 pounds and she had deep wrinkles around her lips and other telltale signs of smoking. That was a new development. All in all, she just looked old and worn out. But underneath it all, I still saw the women who I had given my heart to. I felt nothing for her, but I saw her. She sat alone, in the bride's section of the church, near the back. Her interaction with my daughter had been brief, cordial but distant. She never made any attempt to talk to me. We were never closer than 30 feet to each other until the end of the night. She was outside waiting for a cab. When I saw it on her finger... I smiled for the first time in some time. Maybe she had had done better than me, if the small gold band and minuscule diamond on her left ring finger were any indication. I wandered towards her, staring at it for several moments. When I looked up to meet her eyes, there was a deep sadness behind her gaze. For the record, you ruined my life first. I looked down at her left hand, then back into her eyes. I am glad you found someone. I hope he makes you happy. I walked quickly to my car. My driver had bad been waiting attentively. Good evening, Mr. Smith. I hope you had a pleasant evening, sir. Are we off to the club? It went as well as I could have hoped for, Jonathan. Let's head straight back to the house. I think I would like to be alone tonight. Certainly, sir. As we pulled away, I tried my best not to look back. But I did catch her brief wave. Goodbye. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.